Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Empower App Show. My name is Leo Dion. I'm glad you could join us today. If you could please take some time to go to Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast platform you use and give us some reviews, I would really appreciate it. And then just tweet at us if you're listening to this episode and let us know what topics you want to hear about or what has been some of your favorite episodes. I'd love to hear your feedback. I'm on Twitter at Leo G. Dion. My company is at Bright Digit. And today we have with us Jeff Kelly. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Good. How are you doing? Great. I'm really glad to have you on. Tell folks exactly who you are and what you do. Sure. My name is Jeff Kelly, and I'm an iOS developer at Detroit Labs in Detroit, Michigan. I've been making iOS apps for pretty much since they came out, since 2008. I do some other platform stuff as well, mostly Apple Watch as well. I mean, we do apps for clients, so I've been working behind the scenes for like a decade doing enterprise apps that uh, most people haven't used. That's both awesome and probably a little bit disappointing, but it pays the bills, right? It does. It does. <laughs> it's funny you're talking about Apple Watch unit testing because you came up the other day when I was Googling that specific topic. So I don't know if I've told you about the little app I've been working on for tracking your heart rate while you live stream video games. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called Heart Twitch. And it was just my way of building an app that uses Vapor and Apple Watch independent apps and doing sure. Swift UI and all that stuff. But one of the issues I ran into is just how, especially with an independent watch app, and I'm hoping we'll get something in June, there's no way to do unit testing. Yeah, yeah. So in Xcode, there's just no support for running unit tests with a watchOS target. I don't know if they ever intend on adding that, but... Well, you'd think with independent watch apps, they would, right? You would hope so, especially even just UI tests to make sure that you can use the UI of the watch app. There are some workarounds you can do. So one of the things I was looking at that I never actually finished was basically putting all of your watch tests in a watch app that you would trigger from an iOS app that then the iOS app would be running unit tests and using like watch connectivity to send commands and retrieve status from the watch app. But that would require a whole lot of uh, command line wrangling of the watch simulator, uh, launching the app from the command line during the iOS unit test. So I never quite finished uh, doing it, but there's at least a path forward if, if that's what you're trying to do. The easy answer is to just make whatever you're trying to test a Swift package. And then assuming you're not using like watchOS specific API, you could test it on a different platform. Uh, and then at least you know that Swift package is tested and integrate that into the watch app. So something like HealthKit, would you be able to code around that in a Swift package? You know, I haven't tried and HealthKit is interesting, especially in the context of testing. A lot of the HealthKit classes are difficult to create on your own. Yes. And <laughs> uh, the typical like testing approaches of mocking and stubbing are very, very difficult with an API like HealthKit. Uh, I don't think it's impossible, but it's a, it's a balancing act between how difficult it is to do adequate testing and what that testing is worth to your app. I'm glad at least if I run simulator, it can mock the health data. Mm -hmm. Like that works okay. But yeah, as far as like robust unit testing, health kit becomes really difficult because then it requires a lot of mocking in order to get a robust unit test up and working. Yeah, and that's that's when I usually just fall back to the old school style of a lot of log statements and then viewing those log statements from another device and making sure that at least the log statements look right when you're handling like, you know, health kit callbacks. Right, right, exactly. Now that we're kind of talking about log statements, debugging, and things like that, you did a big talk, um, and I've known you've you've covered this topic quite a bit. Our topic, main topic for today, handling errors when it comes to your application. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of options that Swift gives us for handling errors, and from day one, it's been pretty cognizant. Being a strong typed language, mm -hmm. we're given a lot of opportunities to 
act upon specific errors or specific properties in certain ways. You know, that's really what I want to talk about today is kind of how error handling has really changed with Swift as opposed to Objective-C. Sure. And why why has Apple made those decisions and the Swift language team made those decisions over, you know, the last five years? Sounds great. So I guess, do we want to start very back at the beginning with Objective-C and what uh, what the state of the art was back then? <laughs> if we have to, yes. Let's do that. <laughs> Hey, I wanted to let you know that Empower App Show is looking for sponsors and patrons. Our audience is growing and we'd love to showcase you, your company, and your product on our show. If you want to be a patron, you can find us at patreon.com slash empowerapps.show. Or if you want to be a sponsor, reach out to me personally at leo at brightdigit.com. Your support is greatly appreciated and we look forward to showcasing your business and product on our show. Okay, so I'm actually going to go even a little bit further back. So anybody who's used kind of older C APIs, you might be familiar with like the OS status type. So you call some command, and then it returns a status. And hopefully that status is okay. And a lot of APIs uh, that are C-based, if that status is not okay, uh, you have to call another function to get the error that happened. So OpenGL works this way. So you, you do a thing, you check the status, and if the status is OK, then great, move on. If not, you call another thing, get the error, and then figure out what to do from there. In OpenGL, this usually means you're looking at a black screen, which is very disheartening. So Objective-C kind of built a standardized, object-oriented way to do this, where they had the NS error class. And then when you would call something that could fail, it would return a Boolean. Um, a good example of this is like a, a file manager removing an item or something like that. And then one of the parameters, usually the last parameter of the method, would be a pointer to an error pointer. So you'll see two stars in a row in Objective-C. And that's basically storage that you give the method. And if an error happens, it will store a pointer to that error in the storage you passed in. So now uh, you look at the return value of the function. Let's say there's no file at the path you're trying to delete, so that fails. So that Boolean would be false. So you'll typically call that success, right? So you try a thing, and then success is false. Now you at least have that error that you can look at. When this came to Swift, that, you know, that pattern was pretty pervasive around Apple's APIs. So the very first version of Swift didn't have throwing and catching errors. And so instead they had an NS error pointer type that would handle this. Yeah. And I remember that. I remember <laughs> that like this is pre errors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and very quickly, like that was a thing that they wanted to fix. So those methods that, that have an error parameter as the, an error pointer as the last parameter and they return a Boolean in Swift, those automatically are imported as uh, methods that can throw errors. So any Swift method before the return arrow can be annotated with the word throws. And that indicates that this method can produce an error. And this means that now in the language, you have to do something with it. So in Objective-C and in C, you know, you can store the value of these things in a Boolean or OS status or whatever. Maybe you have a pointer to an error, but there's nothing that makes you handle it. So it's very easy, and we've all done this, right? So you, you do the thing, and then you have an if statement. And what you're focused on is the successful case. You know, you want to do a thing after removing that file. So you write that, and then in the else clause, if there is one, maybe you have a comment that says, to do, fix this. <laughs> and hopefully you don't keep those around forever. Yeah, hopefully. And <laughs> it's really fun working on a, a large code base with a lot of developers, one common pattern you'll see is a build script that will go through and turn those to-dos into warnings and say, hey, actually, we should just do this thing instead of having a to-do in our code forever. Like Once you hit like a decade of a to-do being in the code, it's probably never going to happen. Right, exactly. <laughs> so in Swift, anything that's marked as throws, you can't just call it. You have to address the error somehow. So the line that calls it has to use the try operator, I guess it's an operator, I'm not sure. So 
you would try to do the thing, and that try can then produce an error. So the typical canonical way of handling this is using a do catch block. So you hit site do, and then embraces all of your commands that could produce an error. And at the end of that, you can catch those errors and handle them. Um, you can also just put try with a question mark to make the return value optional or an exclamation point to make it crash if it's nil or throws an error. But the ideal case is you have this catch block. And even if that catch block just has a to-do in it, like you have somewhere in your code that is acknowledging this thing might fail. And so that's kind of how Swift encourages people to handle those errors. And it seems like like even pre-error, I, I don't know if you want to call it error state, but like one of the earlier things that Objective-C used to do was having to check if values were nil mm -hmm. because everything was a pointer. And you can kind of tell just from that indication that the way Swift had handled nil objects with optional, it kind of had brought that pattern of strictness over to errors, it seems like. Yeah, so that's another common pattern is you'll have a method that can return an object and it'll return nil if some error happens. So in Swift, it would return a non-optional type, but use throws to indicate that if something happens, it's going to throw an error. And, and that's a lot cleaner to deal with once you're doing it because you know you have a return value. And it helps to differentiate because there could be a method that where nil is a valid return value, right? Uh, it could be like you're reading from some database and you're looking for an object and that object not existing and returning nil is a very different case than we couldn't access the database because the file isn't there and returning nil plus an error. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good example of where you want to distinguish between something not being found in an error mm -hmm. as far as the database is concerned. Do you typically do in cases where you do have an error? like? Do you crash the app? Do you display an error message? How do you decide in each case what to do? And what, what have you done in some of those circumstances? Yeah, so it, it really depends on what the process was that started producing this error. So uh, the most common case of an error is going to be like a network problem. So maybe your user is driving through a tunnel. Maybe they're on an airplane on a captive Wi-Fi network and they can't access your service. In the case where it's like a request generated by user action, so maybe you went to delete something or add something or save something, in that case, you're probably already showing some kind of network activity indicator telling the user that you know something is in progress. And in those cases, I do like to throw up a dialogue saying, you know, this thing failed and give the user the option to try again. Now, depending on the architecture of your application, uh, there have been a lot of times when people who are maybe stakeholders in the application will say, hey, we should have this try again button, and not necessarily realizing how difficult it can be to do that try again if your architecture isn't set up for it. So if you have a UI completely separate from your networking architecture, surfacing that try again back to the UI and having it go all the way back to your networking is not always straightforward. But if you can, it's a good thing to do. But one thing that's really important is deciding what level of detail to show your users in that message. You don't necessarily want to include the entire message. A, because it's confusing to non-technical users, but B, that can actually lead to security issues. So we've seen, you know, if you go to a website and there's some failure and you get like a, an ASP.NET stack trace. That's exactly what I was thinking of, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that yellow page, that's not great because now like you know a lot about how that application is written just by seeing this error page. So uh, one of the examples you might see in catching an error would just be to show an alert and the title or the message of that alert is the localized description of the error object. And sometimes that's not really intended to be user facing. Most users of your application don't need to know like Coco URL error codes. So the problem is, though, some of those error messages could be really helpful to developers. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that developers can keep track of those errors? Because I'm thinking of things like uh, Crashalytics or um, 
bug snag yeah. or the various tools out there might be useful in tracking those errors as opposed to displaying them to the user, correct? Absolutely. And this is something that I've used to great effect. So one of the common app uh, like verticals that we work in is like quick service restaurants. And typically a restaurant has some kind of vendor that they work with to maintain the actual ordering API. And so that kind of leads to this three-way dance between the client, the actual restaurant, right, and the vendor of the API and us as client app developers. So one thing that we did is in this app, we made sure that any of the network calls that produced an error would log something to Crashlytics. And then that would include things like the error code and the URL that we were trying to hit because you can embed extra metadata in that log of the error message. So that gave not only us, but it gave the client a dashboard that we could go to and see in real time, oh, it looks like this particular call is producing a ton of 401 errors. And then instead of trying to contact us to figure out why is the app not working, they had all the information they needed to talk to the API vendor about why is this call failing. And that helped us like figure out the root cause of failures much quicker than it would have been if we had to try to reproduce the issue on our own devices, figure out what the failing URL is, and then figure out whose responsibility it is to fix it. Wow, interesting. So yeah, that seems like a perfect case of logging errors when it comes with some sort of Mm -hmm. third-party API, I assume, that these clients are using. Um, I was also going to say that the way that we integrated that was just this with our integ- with the same way that we logged everything. So we had one centralized place in the app where we could call like, you know, log.info and give some extra info for debugging. Anytime it was an error level, that same message that would send to the console would just automatically post up to Crashlytics. So we didn't even have to think about it in terms of writing our day-to-day code. Yeah, I'm trying to think of what kind of pattern that is. But yeah, I get what you mean, where you have basically like, you have a logging system set up, and then depending on the level, it either goes to your debugging logs or console mm-hmm. logs, or it goes to Crash Linux, depending on on the level, it sounds like. Yep, and it can go to multiple loggers as well. So it can do the console and Crash Linux at the same time. Nice. So what are some differences or changes you might make depending on if this is a debug build or a release build? So aside from just like changing the log level and making sure that the debug builds give you much more information in the logs, because for a release build, you know, users can see those logs. So you don't necessarily want to log things like your routing in your servers and low level details of how the app works. But also in the debug settings, one thing we usually use is some kind of proxy server to investigate requests. And in a release build, you're going to want to have SSL pinning enabled so that these proxies, they basically, like, so for instance, Charles proxy, they basically work by performing a man in the middle attack on the networking of your app so that you can intercept any network call and see the contents of it, even over HTTPS. SSL pinning defeats those attacks by ensuring that the request is signed with the actual certificate, or at least public key, for your backend server. The buffer debug, enabling that to be circumvented, allows you to not only inspect all the traffic in the app, but also modify it. So we have a whole slew of canned responses It can be really hard to create some of these error scenarios in like regular day-to-day use of the app because a lot of them are exceptional. Maybe that this error only happens in a a particular server race condition with two people using the app at once. Instead of trying to reproduce that, we found it's it's useful to save a response from the back end or create one and then Using Charles or a tool like it, you can say, whenever this URL is hit with these parameters, return the contents of this file. And so that lets you perfectly reproduce any kind of error state in your app. Make sure your app does the right thing without necessarily having to go to the server and reproduce it. Oh, that's really cool. And Charles Proxy, is that available on the Mac, I guess? 
It is available on the Mac. There is also an iOS version. The iOS version, it actually works by creating a VPN to itself on your device. So that can be extremely useful, but one of the issues that you have with Charles Proxy is that you have to make sure that the device trusts the the key that Charles creates for you. So, I mean, there's all kinds of setup guides. We have a, a free guide available online that my coworker Nalita wrote uh, just as a way to like get up and running with debugging Charles in an app. Awesome. We'll provide a link to that in our show notes. Awesome. So one thing I wanted to ask about is we talked about error messages or throwing it to a, like a bug tracking service. Mm-hmm. However, there's like other calls you can make in Swift such as like a fatal error or doing an assert mm-hmm. or, you know, doing a conditional check. When are those applicable in your application when you're developing it? Yeah, so sometimes there is no good way to recover from an error. I think a lot about my son's iPad where he's got a 32 gig iPad and that thing, especially after the, uh, the launch of Apple Arcade, is just completely full all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine. <laughs> and, and it gets to the point where he will literally have zero bytes free on the disk. And it's interesting seeing how different apps react to that situation. But if you know that your app needs to write a certain amount to the disk and there's no free space, like sometimes there's just no good way to handle a situation. And fatal error is good in those situations because then you know at least that you're going to quit the app and maybe you'll avoid something catastrophic. So it's it shouldn't necessarily be the first tool that you go to. Like you don't want to crash on every single error because then you'll have an app where as soon as your user goes into a tunnel, it'll crash. And that's not good either. But if there's no good option, fatal error is like a it's like a safety valve you can flip just to make sure your app stops. One thing I'm thinking is like on app setup when something is required and that, you know, something stupid is required that should always work 99% Mm -hmm. of the time, Mm -hmm. you know, and it could possibly throw an error. Like for instance, the one thing I could think of, I guess it's not a fatal error, but more like an unwrapped optional is like your IP outlets. Mm -hmm. As much as we're transitioning away from storyboards, I think people still use them. But like you assume 99% of the time while you're developing an app that those IP outlets are set up correctly. Yeah. So if it crashes, it crashes. And then also cases where you have like compiled pieces of like a database or a plist setup that should always exist and you need to run the app like that's a good example of doing a fatal error as well mm-hmm. yeah like there's no good reason that an app should fail like to deserialize a view controller from a nib for instance if that happens chances are like there's more that has gone wrong or maybe your app is being tampered with and so just shutting down is probably the right case or the right solution in those cases. And I think there are some cases where you may want to like show an error message and then, mm-hmm. you know, say, hey, sorry, there's been a serious error. You know, tap this button here to close the application. And then maybe that might be a good instance of throwing a fatal error. Yeah. You know, there's also the exit call. So you can just call exit with zero as a parameter uh, to indicate that you exited successfully. I'm not 100% sure on if that's acceptable in the App Store. Yeah, I was about to ask that because I'd be, you know, on the Mac, obviously it makes sense, Mm -hmm. but iOS, I could see how the App Store might not be so happy about that. (laughs) Yeah, and that's that's one thing I'm working with right now and on the app that I'm currently working on is for the app to function, we need to be able to use the Motion and Fitness API. And that's a thing that you can disable globally. And if that happens, we have to tell the user, hey, you need to go to settings and re-enable this globally so that this app can ask for that permission. The problem is when that happens, there's no callback and we can't determine that the user has changed that. And worse, if you go change it in settings and come back to the app, reading that value will still say it's restricted. Oh, wow. So the only way to fix it is when the user leaves the app. Restart the app. Is to, yeah, force quit the app so that it can get that new value. So what we have is we have a thing that when the user leaves the app, is it just 
you know, does fatal error and kills the app so that when they come back to it, it'll relaunch fresh. The things you have to do. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, I've reported this as a bug to Apple. So let's talk a little bit then about like assert or precondition. Mm-hmm. What are those applicable when you're checking error states? Yeah, precondition is interesting. It's mostly like fatal error. If you call precondition failure, then that will just crash the app. If you call precondition, then that wants a Boolean statement inside of the parameter. So you can say, for instance, precondition something is not nil. And that will crash if that's false. So that's a good way to add checks that you don't necessarily need to have an if statement. You just need to make sure a thing is true. So the difference between precondition and fatal error is if you compile with the unchecked optimization level, which tells Swift basically assume nothing bad will ever happen, then it won't crash. So the big difference between fatal error and precondition failure is that fatal error returns the never type. So you're guaranteed that after you call that, it will not continue running your app. Precondition doesn't because there are cases when it can keep running to the next line. Assert is even more, has more conditions where it won't crash. So it only crashes on debug builds by default. So assert is a great place to put notes to yourself as a programmer. So it's good, for instance, if you want to make sure that you can DQ a table view cell from a storyboard. Having an assert in there is a good kind of first level check that will give you some kind of feedback as a developer, but it won't do something in the release version of the app. Interesting. So fatal error will always crash the app. Assert will only crash the app on debug, and then precondition only crashes if you have the optimization unchecked. Is that what you said? It will crash unless you have that optimization level. And that's usually enabled on release, correct? Uh, No. So for release, it does not use unchecked. Okay. It'd be a thing that you would have had to specifically enable. I think it's really mostly used for applications that need a lot of performance with like floating point calculations that don't want to do a lot of error checking. I could be completely wrong on that, but I have never, uh, in my line of work, I have not had a case to use unchecked. Okay, interesting. All right. So, yeah, I like that example of where you DQ table view cell because we've I've written that code hundreds of times. And so like you just pretty much in the in that kind of case, you just use it as or I guess to check if that cell actually exists, correct? Yeah, and, and if you use an assert, you still have to figure out like what is the app going to do from that point? Is it better to just crash if you can't DQ the cell? Or is there some way that you can fall back to some default cell? And, and the choice that you make really depends, depends on, on, the app. on the app. Yeah, exactly. So the other thing you like to think about is apps are going to throw error states, and we need to test for those. Mm-hmm. What are some ways that we can work with unit tests and throwing errors? Yeah, so one of the built-in functions of XC test is XCT assert throws, right? So you can... You can call some statement and assert that it's going to throw an error. And you can even test that it throws a specific error. And that's good. That lets you reason about the flow of of your code. One of the things that happened on a previous client was they had some standards around code coverage. And there's a lot of opinions about code coverage out there, whether it's useful, what it actually means. If you've never used code coverage tools, they basically tell you, which lines of your app executed during the test run doesn't necessarily tell you that they were supposed to execute or that they computed the right value, just that in the running of the tests, this line of code ran. So this client had a certain standard, a certain percentage level of lines that had to be covered by tests. And when you enable code coverage in Xcode, you get a nice little sidebar that has green for this line ran and red for this line didn't run. And one of the things I noticed doing it was that we had some lines that would call fatal error in these exceptional cases. And they were always red because as soon as a test calls fatal error, the test itself crashes and that does not get recorded as that line being run and the test is seen as a failure. So, What I really wanted was some way to, similar to how you can call XCT assert 
throws or a certain throw, something like that for fatal error. And there's a blog post by Marco Santa that outlines a way to do this with fatal error. And it takes advantage of the fact that in Swift, kind of the built-in Swift keywords are their functions, but they are last in the precedence order of what the compiler will find. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So if you write your own function and it's called fatal error and the signature matches, then it will call that instead. So what you can do is you can kind of build this test scaffold for fatal error that allows you to assert that this thing happened while you're running a test, but in release mode, the default behavior of this replacement fatal error is to just to call the built-in swift dot fatal error. So that lets you at least test that given this circumstance in the code, you know that it's going to call fatal error and you can reason about what's going to happen in your code. So the one thing I've played around with is adding methods to that are only available uh, in debug mode where you can give it a mm -hmm. fatal error callback. Mm -hmm. And then that method gets called, but in release it gets called with a nil and then it just uses the swift dot fatal error. Mm -hmm. But in unit testing, I just supply whatever method I want to it to call for fatal error and then use that as a way to like check that that method gets called in a fatal error state. Yep, yep. that's pretty much the same approach. Yeah, yep. So yeah, the only issue is you have to add some sort of scaffolding to your API in order for fatal error to be open and more or less editable mm -hmm. in a test situation. Yeah, and then once you've done that, so once you have this fatal error infrastructure, one of the nice code hygiene things I like to do is I like to hang everything off of the error type. So instead of calling fatal error with some string message, I make my replacement take an actual error type. Uh, and that does a couple of things. One, it makes it so that you don't have to type dot localized description everywhere in your code where you want to call fatal error. But it also lets you test in your code except that a specific error. So if your error type conforms to equatable, not only can you say that you expect a fatal error to happen, but that you expect a fatal error to happen with this specific error type. Oh. And that lets you know not only that your app did what it was supposed to do when the error happened, but that it wasn't some other error that snuck in. Because if you're just testing that it caused fatal error, there may be multiple things that could happen that could cause that. And if you're not 100% sure why, that can lead to problems down the road. Interesting. I hadn't thought of that. That's really cool. So it seems like in a lot of these cases, error handling should be thought out, specifically we're talking like edge cases, mm -hmm. should be thought out earlier in the design and development process of an app. So what are some things like managers can do to both help developers make that part of their process, but also designers to make sure that designers handle those special cases? Sure. And this is obviously going to be different depending on the type of team it is. Given that I work on a lot of large enterprise apps, that's where my most of my experience is. And typically, you'll have designers doing a lot of work up front to figure out what the app is going to look like, how it's going to behave. And then those designs get translated into story cards that uh, have individual units of work. So for the designers, their role in ensuring that errors are handled properly is twofold. So first, to show how the app should react and handle these errors, whether that's throwing up a dialogue or maybe just some message that can be dismissed within the app, like a little, little notification bar or something, and also the wording of those. Developers are not always great copywriters. <laughs> and typically, <laughs> yes. typically in an app, you're going to want to have localized strings anyway for any you know, user-facing UI string. And so you want to make sure that that matches the tone and the voice of the rest of the app, not just like, oh no, an error occurred. Because that might be fine for some kind of like weather app, but if it's like a banking app and it's like, oh no, an error occurred, that can be like panic-inducing. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean, oh no? Right. And then when it goes on to the managers, typically you'll see the manager's involvement in determining, okay, what are we going to work on next? Which cards of this giant backlog are we going to pull into the next two-week sprint? And 
There, anytime those cards involve a process that can fail, it's important to identify which processes those are and make sure that there is a card somewhere that has that handling that error in its acceptance criteria. So you don't mark a card as or a task as ready to work on until it's defined as to what happens when it fails. Okay, very interesting. And I'm only somewhat familiar with story cards and things like that, but it sounds like you've really integrated the errors and those edge cases as part of the agile process overall. Yeah, absolutely. And our projects, you know, they go in varying degrees and flavors of agile, but it's it's ultimately the whole team's responsibility. So as a developer, when you start working on a card, if it's not fleshed out, if you don't know what to do, it's important at the beginning of that implementation to ask the question and say, hey, what happens if this network request fails? So that even while you work on the happy path, you have it you know, in everyone's mind that we need to also handle this error. Awesome. So I saw you at CodeMash um, and you did a really good talk, which we'll post in the notes on error handling. Thank you. And then you also did the error handling talk when I saw you at 360 iDev, right? Yep. Yeah, and I did the talk there, by the way, on uh, asynchronous uh, development and how much that's become a bigger and bigger deal. Uh, Excellent. As technology has gotten better and better. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll ask you, like, what have you seen as far as when it comes to development in the Apple space, how we handle hairs when it comes to, like, asynchronous programming, specifically, you know, things that have callbacks or promises, futures. And of course, you know, we can't go one podcast episode without talking about Swift UI and combine. How are errors handled in those cases? Sure. So that was kind of a, a parallel development to Swift being developed and worked on internally at Apple is that more and more of Apple's APIs became asynchronous. So instead of calling the API and maybe getting a delegate call back later, you would pass in a completion handler. And a typical pattern for a completion handler is a lot like the return status of a Boolean. You'll have a a Boolean as one of the parameters, and then maybe you'll have an optional object that is returned to you, and then perhaps an error. And unlike the synchronous methods that, that return an error pointer, in Swift, these are translated pretty much the same way. So the the callback that you have will have a potential error and maybe an optional argument or a Boolean. And so inside these callbacks, I think the most common case you'll see is like a network request. So maybe you are using Alamo Fire and you call some request and you try to serialize it. And so now you have one of two things. You have a deserialized object from the network or you have some error as to what happened. And... I think it was Swift 4, this was brought to the standard library as the result type. Yes, I love the result type. Yeah, the result type is great. And it had already existed in the Swift community before because it's such a common case where it's an enum that has two cases. There's the success case and the failure case. Using result, you can uh, make sure that you have one of those two cases because if you just have two parameters, one is an optional object and one is an optional error, then it's possible to get into state where they're both nil. And then what do you do? Using result and having non-optional types, you know you have one or the other. And that just makes it easier to handle uh, that code. I mean, you mentioned Swift UI and combine. And so result is actually a really good way to talk, uh, to kind of transition to talking about combine because combine is built on top of publishers. So just like Rx Swift or any kind of reactive programming, you can have a value that changes over time. And a publisher has two types. There's the output and there's the failure. And that's pretty much exactly like a result. It's very easy to kind of plug in a result to a publisher. The thing I found with Swift UI is it's very, very strict on what result you're getting back from the publisher to the point where it never expects an error back, right? Yes. So that's where it uses the never error, the quote unquote error type, uh, because what it's essentially saying is, look, you have to like 
this has to be used in the UI in some way. Mm -hmm. And if it like, if we don't get a result back or we do, we never expect an error. And it's up to you using some sort of functional programming to take that publisher and handle the error in your own way. So that way the UI is updated correctly, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's the big difference between using publishers to drive your Swift UI interface versus you know, using do and try and catch to handle errors is that you don't really have a choice. Because of the type system, the way it works, any publisher that calls into SwiftUI that SwiftUI will ask for updates back from, it has to have a failure type of never. Which is the return type of a fatal error, for instance, which in other words is a way of saying like, this function will never return anything because the app, it just that never happens essentially, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there is no scenario where it could ever be in this failure state. So a good example is notification center. You subscribe to the notification center uh, for some notification. And then there's not really a good sense of like, well, what is a failure? Like either the notification got sent or it didn't. There's no failure state there. There may be some extra info in like the user info dictionary of the notification, but it still sends something. Right, exactly. Uh, so it doesn't make sense for it to have a failure type. Now, in a network request, there's you know all kinds of things that can happen between you sending the request and getting your model object back. So what you have to do is, in that publisher, determine how you're going to handle those errors. So maybe you retry. You can have certain thresholds for retrying. What are the easiest things to do? is to have a static member of your model type called placeholder and just return that placeholder data. If you don't really care about the network error, you just have to show something. And then in your publisher, you can catch any error and return a different publisher that just returns that placeholder just to feed that page. Okay, gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, and I've had to handle this with, you know, health kit stuff where it's like I need to be able to handle the case where somebody doesn't approve mm-hmm. of getting the heart rate or there's an error getting the heart rate or something like that. And it's just a matter. What I like about it is it forces the developer and the design team to handle those states in some sort of fashion mm-hmm. in the UI, essentially. And health kit is interesting too because those errors are specifically meant to be handled gracefully in the app. So if you have an app that uh, is recording workout data and heart rate and your height and weight, the user can approve or deny any specific set of those permissions. And you have to still keep going. Maybe they don't want you to read their height and weight, but they're okay with you reading their heart rate. You have to handle that and only read what they allow. But also they can go into the health preferences at any time and grant or revoke those permissions at that granular level. So that's a case where you don't just want to have a fatal error because then any user who doesn't want you to read their weight is suddenly just crashing and locked out of the app. My biggest headache is the fact that you can't tell the difference between not being able to read the heart rate because of permissions Mm -hmm. or not being able to read the heart rate because there is none. And that to me is like one of the biggest headaches I have is because there's an example where I wish Apple would have a little bit more granularity Mm -hmm. with their errors, because I like to be able to say to the user, Hey, you know, you just need to go back and grant permission. And then this app will work because I don't know how many support emails I've gotten where people are like, I'm not getting a heart rate. And it's like, well, cause Apple sucks at its <laughs> permissions uh, UI, and you needed to make sure to check that. And it's like, oh, okay. So it's like, yeah. Yeah, you know, we're pretty sure the user does have a heart rate, so something else must be happening. Right, right. And that is kind of probably the biggest missing piece of the picture of handling errors in Swift is that methods that are marked as throws cannot annotate what type of error they throw. Yes. So it can be anything. And I'm used to that in other languages. It always seemed like, oh, like you must be able to say what. Nope, that's not available in Swift and as strict of a language it is. Yeah, and it's interesting because you can do that on the catching side. So you can catch specific errors and you can nest multiple sets of catching specific errors to have different paths for your app. 
but you always have to have one catch all at the end because it could be any type of error. So you have to have one that just catches anything you haven't caught so far. That's something, I don't know if it would make it into Swift 6, but as soon as that does make it into the language, that will allow us to say, for instance, that a network request can only throw URL errors. Mm -hmm. And now you have like a finite set of things that you know that you have to handle. Handle, exactly. Yeah. And so HealthKit could use that too. So it could, <sighs> it could throw like a permission not granted error and you could handle that one specific case separately. Right. If only. We'll get there eventually. Someday. Uh, speaking of which, how about finally statements? How are those useful when it comes to like your try catch or your do catch statements? Yeah, I don't use those a whole lot. Typically, I, I find that like the things that I need to do inside of the do block are either going to kick off some asynchronous process or you know they're going to return some value. The finally, I think can be it can be good for you know doing any kind of cleanup yeah. or transitioning whether or not an error happened. But in my day to day, I don't typically use it a whole lot. It feels like kind of a throwback to earlier days where things needed to be disposed of or closed properly. Mm -hmm. That's what it kind of feels like to me. I, I don't use it very often. I'm curious from the audience if anybody has some great use cases for it. But yeah, I know exactly what you mean. It's like almost like defer. It's a keyword that I've used very, very rarely mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to Swift. Yeah, and it's Swift, I think it's a lot cleaner. Instead of running something after your catch block to make sure that something got cleaned up, is anytime you like grab a resource, like a file handle, is just immediately called defer so that inside your defer block, you're going to like release that file handle or something mm -hmm. so that no matter what happens, you don't have to worry about it. As soon as that leaves scope, it, um, uh, it gets called. Right, right. We talked a little bit about strong typed throws, I guess you can call it. Mm -hmm. What other things are you hoping in the future when it comes to Swift with error handling? So one of the other largest kind of things that Swift doesn't do yet, but probably will someday, is a different story on asynchronous APIs. Yes. Whether that's promises or like async and await. Um, I've used async and await in uh, TypeScript, for instance. Whatever that API winds up being, it's going to have to handle error handling. Yeah, and I think like there's some really good proposals as far as how to do async and await with throws. I've seen that before, mm -hmm. and I talked about that in Denver last year. Yeah, just that syntactic sugar or having a real like robust promise or future type with a result or anything. Because combine is good when it comes to that like reactive stuff mm -hmm. where you have a steady stream of data. But for like really simple stuff, it almost feels like overkill when it's just something like a, a simple URL call, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you can create a publisher, right, for like a URL session data task that returns when that task finishes. But to me, it feels like a publisher is better served for something like a heart rate monitor, mm -hmm. where it's going to be a sequence of values over time, and like a lot of them, and not just one. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Jeff. Where can people find you online? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. So you can find me at, usually Twitter is the easiest way, as uh, Slanchaman. That's S-L-A-U-N-C-H-A-M-A-N. I've had that since eighth grade, so no changing it now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least it didn't have a year on it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I will post a link to that as well as your uh, talk from CodeMash on error handling if people want to deep dive more. Again, thank you so much for coming on. Awesome. Thanks for having me. People can find me on Twitter at Leo G. Dion. My company is at Bright Digit. You can find my website brightdigit.com. Links to the podcast as well as my blogs on Swift topics are there as well. I'd love to hear any feedback you have. Send me an email at leo at brightdigit.com or reach out to me on Twitter as well. And if you could give us a review on any of your podcast platforms like Apple Podcast or Google or Spotify, I would love for you to do that. Just send me a message overall. Love to hear back from you. Thanks again for joining us and we look forward to talking to you again.